Welcome back to my channel everyone, it's Leah with Skin Beautiful RX and today we are talking all things sensitive skin. I get customers, clients all the time thinking they have rosacea and my first question is were you diagnosed from a dermatologist with rosacea? Because while you can have rosacea, absolutely, definitely other things present themselves very similarly including sensitive skin and sensitized skin and it's really good to know which one you actually have. So while well, again you can definitely treat sensitive and rosacea the sensitive skin and rosacea the same way uh, I definitely think it's really important as you guys watch my videos for educational purposes to really understand the differences between the two Sensitive skin is a heightened intolerance, not just to topical applications of products, but also internally. You can definitely have a reaction when you eat certain things, if you are applying certain things to the skin. So really understanding that sensitive skin actually is a multi-layer issue. You have multiple layers of the skin. It doesn't just affect the top layer, it affects every single layer throughout the skin. And the top layer of the skin or the epidermis Sensitive skin has an abnormally functioning stratum cordium. There is an interruption of how the skin hydrates or actually holds on to hydration in the skin, which leads to dryness. Sensitive skin also has an increased tool or transepidermal water loss, again, because of that barrier impairment. With that, you actually have redness throughout every single layer of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and even in the subcutaneous tissue. The redness in the subcutaneous tissue actually comes from the blood vessels in that area are actually larger than what you'll find in normal healthy functioning skin. So there are four types of sensitive skin, rosacea, impaired barrier function, atopic dermatitis, and psoriasis. So today we're really going to focus on the first two which is rosacea and barrier function impairment. So again, rosacea is one of those trigger words recently where I feel like everybody has it even though they actually haven't been clinically diagnosed. So let's go over a few facts about rosacea. So first, it typically presents in people over 30 and men actually have worse uh, side effects from rosacea. And there are many forms of rosacea. Some just start as redness and then some actually have pustules and acne that contribute to, um, that contribute to their skin's disease. Now, there's a big difference because a lot of people, when they start to get uh, acne along the jaw, they again associate this with rosacea. Typically, acne along the jaw is hormonal acne and then people with rosacea will get that acne through the mid face, definitely on the tip of the nose, that spreads throughout the cheek. Of course, redness is associated with rosacea and certain activities can definitely bring this redness on. Of course, you can still get very red when you work out or when you are in a hot environment. However, rosacea suffers, the redness uh, tends to last much longer than just normal skin types. Many people with rosacea also have extremely dry skin. However, because they have these acne pustules, they tend not to want to hydrate the skin because of that long myth that you shouldn't hydrate uh, acne prone skin. However, when the barrier function is impaired, allowing more bacteria in, and we'll get into uh, reasons you may have rosacea in a minute, but not actually hydrating the skin properly and repairing that barrier function actually leads to more actually leads to more aggressive rosacea. There are four main types of rosacea and they can experience the following: persistent redness, flushing, broken capillaries, and breakouts. Subtype 1 usually presents itself as visible redness, redness that lasts a long time and it's in the middle, mid face, so the central third of the face. Subtype 2 is papiopustular rosacea. Again, you're going to have redness in the mid face, but it's also present with pustules and papules in the cheek area, again with the flushing throughout this area. Subtype 3 
is probably the rosacea that's you know the hardest to control presents with thickening of the skin nodules on the skin and then even enlargement of the nose typically like a bulbous nose you'll get really red it gets really red and it'll actually get you know, almost looks like it's swollen. Subtype 3 can also affect the glabella and the chin, and then the glabella is just right here in between the brows. So now we're going to go over the potential causes of rosacea, and again, these are mere theories. There's no conclusive evidence on what causes rosacea. It can be an environmental issue, it can be from, you know, overuse of certain products, it can be, uh, you know, hereditary, so nobody actually knows the real reason. But these that we're going to discuss are the ones that actually have the most clinical evidence to most likely be true. So the first one is vascular dysfunction. People that suffer from uh, rosacea that has been clinically verified as rosacea have a vascular dysfunction. They have more blood vessels that run throughout the, the face, the skin of the face, and a thinner skin. This obviously will make the skin appear more red, more obvious, as well as more chances of having these broken capillaries, which you'll see in a, with a lot of people with rosacea. Next theory is vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, which is a lot easier to say. So VEGF, which we all have, actually stimulates growth and development of new blood vessels in the skin. This has actually been proven to play a role in rosacea. Because this encourages microcapillary hyperpermeability or that leakiness that we talked about earlier in the blood vessels of the skin, uh, this leaking actually causes inflammation. So when this plasma starts leaking out of the blood vessel, it actually causes the skin to have a inflammatory response. This, of course, in turn causes redness. There are also hormone-like substances in the skin that can cause this inflammation response. And then pro-inflammatory cytokines. The so cytokines, we all have them in the skin, but these pro-inflammatory ones are known to be involved in rosacea skin types. So as with all skin conditions, especially if you know that what goes into your body obviously will show on the outside on your skin, we all know that there are certain things both environmentally and what we consume that can cause a trigger for rosacea. So temperature related triggers, and I always remind people that it's just not rosacea that has an issue with temperature, it is also people that suffer from chronic hyperpigmentation. So knowing that excessive sweating, um, saunas, uh, hot yoga, anything with temperature change will cause a response in the skin, just depending on your skin type will depend on how the skin responds. For people that suffer from rosacea, not just exercise, However, spicy foods, caffeine, um, hot sub hot beverages such as coffee um, can cause a trigger response. Alcohol definitely causes a trigger response in the skin. And then people with rosacea always have to know what they're applying topically to the skin because certain ingredients can also cause um, a outbreak, can also cause an active uh, rosacea response. And then of course, I actually did a video on this before. A stressful life can absolutely cause uh, a rosacea trigger. Certain medications, cosmetics, smoking, using the wrong topical products, not just uh, the ingredients in them, but using aggressive skin can definitely cause a trigger response. So now we're gonna move into impaired barrier function and you're gonna see why many people associate their sensitive skin with rosacea when really it is probably an impaired barrier, which for me uh, is definitely an easier thing to treat. The proper function of the barrier comes from a damaged stratum corneum. This results in, this will result in moisture loss of the skin, hypersensitivity, redness, and irritation. For a lot of my clients, I see that their impaired barrier is due to using way too many and for too long really aggressive products on the skin. Other reasons for impaired barrier loss can be due to a climate, the climate that you live in, especially with winter coming up, so we always want to make sure we're protecting that barrier of the skin. It can come from an interruption of the intercellular lipids. It can 
alteration to the keratin in your skin and this can be due to using acids on the skin when these keratins lose the shape due to you know excessive products excessive heat they can't carry out what they're supposed to do to maintain the health of the barrier so again people with an impaired barrier can present very similarly to that type 1 subtype 1 rosacea redness dryness you know flaky skin now the best part of the whole video because of course i absolutely love bringing education to my videos so that you as the customer the client the consumer can better understand your skin and make better choices for your skin now let's talk about controlling symptoms as well as treating the barrier for healthy skin while i go over these i'm actually going to list below in the info bar different products that would definitely address what we're about to go over from gentle exfoliation because even sensitive rosaceous prone skin still needs to exfoliate to keep the skin healthy to uh, topical treatment products and anti-inflammatories all the way up to my favorite um, moisturizers and hydrators for sensitive skin like I just said sensitive rosacea impaired barrier still needs to exfoliate but you have to do it smartly you have to use gentle products i would never recommend manual exfoliants ever 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 not even recommend you just shouldn't use manual exfoliants on sensitive or rosacea prone skin my favorite ones also will include anti-inflammatory ingredients so while we are gently exfoliating the skin we're also still applying in anti-inflammatory ingredients to really control that response to the exfoliation you again should never use really really scrubby products such as microdermabrasion products microcrystals on the skin or uh, do microdermabra microdermabrasion treatments at home or from an esthetician just a huge no-no you can even use very low strength retinols on sensitive skin to get the the cells of the skin working and moving and starting to behave correctly although really you can also use uh, salicylic acids i really really love milk peels for sensitive skin which i'll list below fabulous for really giving a very gentle chemical exfoliant without causing damage or at least aggravating the issues that you currently have the next thing you'll want to do is make sure you're using serums that help to control redness and the inflammation response many of these products work by interrupting the inflammatory process so here are a list of ingredients that are fantastic for helping to control redness on the skin that's present in the skin or helping to control the redness response one of my favorites what i have talked about in multiple videos is santella asiatica which are present in a lot of really really great skincare which is present in a lot of really great formulations having the correct percentage as well as the pharmaceutical version will definitely help compromise skin the most so beta glucan is another wonderful ingredient that you'll find in multiple multiple formulations to help uh, sensitive skin is an anti-irritant and antioxidant that helps control the redness in the skin both brown and red algae also really help to control the redness in the skin Formulations that have high amounts of omega and especially omega-3 and omega-6 Essential fatty acids to the skin also help to provide powerful anti-inflammatory characteristics for when treating the skin Some ingredients with high amount of these two specific omegas are uh, black currant, primrose seed oil, grapeseed oil, and wheat germ oil And then when you combine these with supportive ingredients in the same formulation, you'll even get better results Supportive ingredients would be bisabola and evening primrose which are all great for helping to soothe the skin while these other ingredients are helping to actually control that redness okay so now let's move on to anti-inflammatory and skin soothing ingredients that you should look for when looking for certain formulations for your skin 
aloe vera. I have talked about aloe vera in multiple of my videos and it is the most widely used ingredient in uh, cosmetics and personal skincare because it is so soothing and great for almost every single skin type. Um, I don't know any that it's not good for but you know I don't want to lay out a bold claim just in case somebody watching can't use aloe. However, you know, the first thing you reach for when you get a burn or, you know, whether it be a burn from, you know, an oven or a hot pan or the sun, you reach for aloe. It's going to immediately calm and soothe the skin as well as control the redness a ton of healing properties, making it fantastic for sensitive skin. Of course, hydrocortisone, you can get that, uh, you know, over the counter, you can get it from, you know, a dermatologist, but it is going to control the uh, symptoms associated with sensitive skin, the dryness, the itchiness, the peeling. This is a product, however, you need to limit use on to every seven days, and then, you know, that's a complete cycle. Panthenol or pro vitamin B5. So some people I do want to point out are sensitive to niacinamide or vitamin B and too much of it can actually make you more red. So this is one of those ingredients you definitely have to know your skin. However, for people who can tolerate uh, vitamin B, it will reduce inflammation in the skin as well as help to support the moisture retention. Again, evening primrose will help to control redness in the skin. Excellent source for linoleic acid and omega-3s. This is an anti-redness and anti-inflammation ingredient. Bisabola, which I mentioned earlier, is actually an ingredient derived from chamomile, and it, which is very, very soothing for the skin. Menthol lactate, which a lot of people, when they see that ingredient, they go the exact other way and think, oh my gosh, why are you recommending this product for me? And actually, it is a wonderful cooling ingredient for people suffering from rosacea and sensitive skin. So as soon as you apply it, you will feel like a, a menthol like reaction, but it's actually cooling down the every layer of the skin to help to support the lessening of the redness. It is very, very good for people with sensitive rosacea prone skin. So definitely give that ingredient a chance to do its job because it performs wonderfully. And then AHA salicylic acid are you'll find are very important for people with sensitive skin. Now, understanding the, how much you're using is so important because you don't want to overuse chemical exfoliants either or cause more irritation. So my favorite thing to use is white willow bark extract, which you'll find in a lot of my personal skincare that I use on myself uh, because it helps to regulate uh, cell turnover, but it's also a really great analgesic and it's going to help to calm and soothe uh, temperamental skin. So if you are somebody who definitely needs a, a chemical exfoliant, a chemical ingredient in your skincare, definitely reach for that derivative of salicylic acid and your skin will really thank you for it. I know mine has. I've said in a lot of my videos, you have got to hydrate your skin. For a lot of people, I used to be one of them, it was really, really scary for me to apply hydration to my skin because it was irritated, it was red, it was breaking out. And once I actually repaired my skin's barrier, it was remarkable how much my cha my skin changed, how it just acted differently, how I could introduce new ingredients into my skincare routine and it actually act right. So most importantly, while you're watching this video, please know, keep your skin hydrated. There are a lot of really beneficial hydrators and moisturizers for sensitive and rosacea prone skin that we're gonna go over right now. So we, we want to use both humectant and occlusive ingredients for proper hydration. And I know if you're in our Facebook group, we talk about this all the time. Is it a humectant? Is it an occlusive? Or at least if you talk to me via email, we always talk about using both of these types of ingredients. You know, you can use one or the other. I don't know if I would use a humectant without an occlusive, but I know some people can use occlusives without a humectant. So first, let's go over the different ingredients in humectants versus occlusives. 
So as we know, humectants draw in the moisture into the skin and depending on what type of humectant you're using, it can either do it superficially or it can go really, really deep into the skin. And then of course, an occlusive lays on top of the skin and does not allow the transepidermal water loss or that moisture that you've now sucked into the skin to leave. So it makes an occlusive barrier on the skin and really protects the skin and the hydration uh, that you're trying to preserve. Humectant ingredients are glycerin, uh, hyaluronic acid, sodium hyaluronate, which sodium hyaluronate is actually an ingredient that draws the moisture deeper into the skin while regular hyaluronic acid is more superficial. Urea, sorbitol, honey, and collagen are all wonderful humectants. Exclusive ingredients are niacinamides. You're getting two with one here. You're getting something that's treating redness, treating your skin, as well as acting like an occlusive ingredient, keeping the skin well hydrated. Uh, shea butters are a wonderful occlusive ingredient. Some people don't like shea butters because they think it clogs pores, but it's definitely something great if your skin can tolerate it. Zinc oxide, we all should be using zinc internally and externally. It's a wonderful occlusive. And of course, silicones, which is, if you look at a ingredient list, you'll see it as dimethicone. And I get this question probably more than any. Should I be using an ingredients with dimethicone? Dimethicone is one ingredient that you, I mean, I have not found, and I've searched the internet, I have not found a reason to not use it. Um, I think it gets a really bad rap from people who don't understand the skin or know how to properly treat the skin. It is a wonderful occlusive ingredient. It is not harmful. It doesn't penetrate the skin. So it literally just sits there and keeps your skin protected. So uh, silicones are a great occlusive. Okay, the next thing we want to do for both rosacea prone skin and skin that has an impaired barrier is make sure that we are reducing an overgrowth of bacteria. Of course, I talk about my pillow and my pillowcases all the time. I highly recommend somebody with sensitive skin like myself look into pillowcases that contain copper or silver. They're antibacterial, antimicrobial, and they will not lead to more bacteria overgrowth, which is present in people with rosacea as well as sensitive skin types. And of course, making sure your skin is protected. No matter what skin type you have, you have got to use an SPF of 30 or higher. Making sure that sensitive skin is well protected with the serums you're using, the uh, humectants and occlusives you're using, and then of course your SPF. I talk about this in my consults all the time. I highly prefer a SPF that is mineral. So mineral SPFs uh, lay on top of the skin and protect it, whereas chemical allows uh, the rays to come into the skin, all that heat into the skin, and then it basically um, you know, deflects it back out. So if you're allowing all that heat into the skin, you're gonna have that temperature response, not only with rosacea and sensitive skin, but people that struggle with hyperpigmentation. So for me, it's a no-brainer that people with uh, these skin types only use a mineral SPF. However, that's just my recommendation. If you prefer chemical, that's totally totally fine, but as long as you're using one, that's the most important part. So I hope that this video was extremely helpful in understanding that sensitive skin doesn't automatically mean you have rosacea. We treat them the same way, we hydrate them the same way, we use calming ingredients on these skin types the same way, but it doesn't mean you always have rosacea if you're showing redness, dryness, peeling, and sensitivity. So I hope this video was extremely helpful. Again, below I will list my favorite products to help treat and protect sensitive or rosacea prone skin and of course if you guys have any questions please email us we love hearing from you and I will see you on my next video bye bye